Hallelujah. This morning, I came in here. I thought I was good, and when I saw you guys, I got a little bit emotional. Got your Bibles open to First Samuel, chapter sixteen. That's in the Old Testament. First Samuel's right before Second Samuel. Most of you know, to our guests, thanks for being here today. Most of you know my story. I know we have a lot of new folk in our church. We had people show up at the ranch yesterday that drove in, one man named Gerson, and uh, he's new in the area. He lives over in Roman Forest, and he said, I, he said, this place is beautiful. I said, no, it's not. I said, this is as ugly as you'll ever see this property until perhaps the next flood, because I promise you we, we take care of it. But he said, no, it's beautiful. Said, and so he, he went through the property. And he said, I'm going to come back tomorrow and help you guys uh, put it back together. He's never been to church with us. He just wanted to talk to him about kids camp. And it's amazing uh, the peace of God you find when you, you enter one of our little country churches. And to our people that are here that's not been here before, we thank you for being here. Cochise, even you. Where is he hiding at? Where's Cochise? Uh, why are you all way in the... Oh, Cochise, come sit on front row. <laughs> come sit up here with J-Bo. I know, it's a long walk for you. Anywhere there's an altar is a long walk for you. <laughs> this is one of the oldest biker brothers we got in the church. We love him. Hey, Amen. What he's been through in life and experiences are powerful. We went back to Alabama after uh, starting pastor in a church. And uh, this has been, I don't know, 30 years ago plus. And uh, I went over to visit my friend I was raised up with. His name is Rex. So I was raised up with Rex, Bill, Michael, and David. We were five of us. We ran the mountains. We did a lot of things together. We raced cars. We all had old motorcycles. We just did all kinds of stuff. As kids, we had a great upbringing, I thought. For me, I did anyway. And uh, so Rex's family's this way. There was Max, who became a police officer. There was Rex, who went to the Marines. There was, there was uh, Karen and Jill. And then there was Truman, his dad, who slept all day because he worked all night, his mama, Wanda. I know the whole family because I started going over there when I was in, uh, six years old. We would connect and meet. Rex always had the nicest things. He, if, he, if, he, if I got a car, he got a nicer car. If I got a motorcycle, I got a nicer motorcycle. You know, it's just that kind of way. One day I walked in after starting our first church. His mother looked at me. Now, you got to understand, all my friends went to church. Rex's dad, Truman, was the Baptist deacon. Smoked true cigarettes. I remember because we used to steal them. Uh, so this, this was how I remember him. And he was always the, uh, the straight-laced deacon. And, and Wanda was the, the gossip of the, of the mountain. And, uh, and she looked at me and she said to me, why, why you not him? And, I, and because her son had already been kicked out of the military, he had issues with drinking, and she knew my life, a bootlegging grandson who had issues with alcohol and drugs, and now that I'm born again and, and pastor in church, but her son gone to church since he was a little boy. And she said, why, why you not him? And I don't have the answer for that, you know. And so I was reading the scripture this week, and I'll get to Acts 12 in a little bit, but I hit a place and I asked myself, why, why him, not me? And I kind of reversed that. And that, that has run all over me this week. Why him and not me? Why did they get flooded and not me? Why, uh, why did my friend Bishop Miller die at 61 and I'm 63 and not me? Why did my friend Rick Hawkins get leukemia and not me? You ever ask yourself these questions? Why are their kids good and yours are hellions? And you know you raised them as best you could, and their parents were no good, and their kids. You don't have these answers, and I don't know if I can give you the answer to all of this today, but I can tell you this will be the thing we will believe God for when we get to heaven, the whys of this world, why this has happened. I told somebody, and I don't mean this mean, but there's a lot of bad things happening in the world. Uh, there, there's a war going on in Israel and Gaza. With the Palestinians and the Jews, uh, the Russians and Ukraine, uh, Northern Africa is an absolute mess, and we don't hear about the genocide of that. We just had 20 something kids from Uganda stay with us, and most of them have no parents. At 20 something kids, I mean, you're talking about loving. We just had them, they just need a place to stay, they need a place to preach. They, 
They've been here for seven months. And, uh, but they, the genocide has wiped out their family, you know. So you ask yourself, why them not? So no matter how bad things happen to us here, we got it good. I know by some of you, you, when the Astros lose, you, your whole world shatters. <laughs> you're in trouble. Chris, you're just in trouble. I'm just going to tell you straight up. Amen. So, you know, I love our sports teams. I love, uh, you know, of course, I got family in Colorado, so I love Denver. Uh, the Nuggets, you know, and they lost it in my world. I still slept well, you know. So you just, you just got to keep pressing on. Good to have you guys back again. I, just, I mean that from up there. So as I, as I walk through this, I want to share with you very quickly. Some of this will be kind of in a story form because it's important you catch it. So we're going to go to the negative side first, and then we'll go to the positive. But in the, where I'm at right now, you've got a prophet named Samuel. My brother said to me, my brother's 61, and he says to me, he said, man, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm in elementary school learning the Bible. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to Bible stories on, on TV, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pick it up because I don't know them. And I thought, yeah, I still learn it. So there's a prophet named Samuel in the Old Testament. There's a king the first king of Israel, his name was Saul. It was not the will of God to even give them a king, but they wanted a king. So they picked a man who was head and shoulders taller than everybody else and handsome. And so they grabbed a king named Saul. There's, there's a, a, an older brother named Eliab, and he is the oldest brother of uh, David, King David, who's going to be the king. But he's the oldest brother. So these are basically the people we're going to look. We're going to talk about the father Jesse just a little bit. So the Samuel, prophet Samuel, gets a word from God to go and anoint a king. Now, they've already got a king, but he gets a word to go anoint a king. And he knows that if he goes through a certain area and Saul, the king, finds out about it, he'll kill him. So God tells him, this is, some of you are so black and white, you never see gray. I am a man that sees a lot of gray, 43. Amen. I can see it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. God told Samuel, just take a, a calf with you. Take an animal. And if anybody asks, tell them you've gone to sacrifice. That's a, it's called a ruse. Amen. So that King Saul don't kill you. I mean, God could have smacked King Saul, but he, uh, but he let it go. So here, here he comes in. And when he gets there, Jesse and him and the whole town sees that Samuel's coming, and they're scared because he's a prophet. And, and Porsche, if he says something to them, all of a sudden, they're scared. And he said, are you coming peacefully? He said, I'm coming in peace. It's all good. And he goes to the house of Jesse. When he gets to Jesse's house, amen, he, he looks at him, and verse 6 says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, that's the oldest brother, and Samuel, the, the prophet, thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me because this dude is tall like the old king. He looks like, you know, I saw somebody say, and this might be true, we don't even need a president for the next four years. Let's just stay single for a while. <laughs> just a thought. I thought it was cute. Amen. Uh, Surely the Lord's anointing stands before, here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. You know, he looks like Saul. But don't, 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 you know, he, he looks like our next pastor. He looks like the guy that ought to be. You, you can't do that. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord's not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. Samuel said, nor this one the Lord has chosen. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these either. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? He said, no, I got an eighth son. Now, eight is always the number of new beginnings. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And then you start over. If you know anything about music. And that's all I know. He said, they're still the youngest, Jesse said, but he's tending sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We're not even going to sit down until he gets here. So they stood up and they waited on him. Now, let's talk about Eliab. Eliab is the oldest brother. He thought he was going to be the next king. He stood there. Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the king. Hey, I can see him thinking to himself, I'm ambitious. I'm tall. Like King Saul, I'm the firstborn. Surely the firstborn should get it. I'm handsome. Pick me, pick me, pick me. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, it started passing over, and he passed by him. Then it went to the other brother, and I can see Eliab saying, don't pick him. I know what he did last Tuesday. 
Amen. Don't pick that one over there. Amen. I, I, he's lazy. Don't pick that one. And I can see him thinking to himself, you can't pick him. And then here comes David in, who we believe is probably 16, about 16 years old, comes in, and all of a sudden Eliab said, why him and not me? Why are you going to pick the little runt out of the litter and not me? And I've asked, and I know people have even asked that about myself. Why, God, did you pick Jerry to do what he's doing? You, I mean, he had to start all over again 20 years ago, and you blessed him again. Why him and not? We'll always ask these questions. Why, why is this one handsome? And look what happened to me. Good question. Just look at your mom and daddy. Okay, let's stay right here. <laughs> so there's still a younger one. He's tending sheep. Amen. And God whispered in Samuel's ear, the heart matters. Everybody say, the heart matters. That's what matters here. The Lord does not look at the things people look at, but people look at the outward. We always look at the outward appearance. We always see the, 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 uh, the superstars. We see the, the musical uh, artists and all that, and all we see is the outside. We don't see what's going on on the inside. We don't always know because, first off, we always see the outer appearance first. You got to go through some storms together to see a heart. You got to go through tough times together to see a heart. You got to have some, some lean years to see a heart. Amen. And God had looked at this young man and said he was tending sheep, looking after sheep, singing to me. In his private time, David was singing unto the Lord. When nobody else was looking, David had his harp and he was making up songs. He was writing psalms to the Lord. He was taking and tending toward the sheep. He was taking out a lion and a bear. God saw all of his prayer and he saw your private time. And God saw your heart. It wasn't what you was doing when you was in front when everybody else could notice you. It was your private time God saw you. See, what happened was God began to groom this young man for ministry. He began to groom him for kingship, if you would. The Israelite army trusted in appearances more than, God, than they did God. That's why they picked King Saul. So David had this grooming time. First Samuel 16, we were just going to keep walking very quickly. It's not going to be the story you used to hear me share. Listen to me. One of the servants answered, Saul started having issues, night terrors, bad dreams, evil spirits. He said, I don't know what to do. And so somebody said, one of the servants said, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. That's a musical instrument. He's a brave man and a warrior. Now, hold on. He's 16. He's still a teenager, but he's a brave man and a warrior. See, you ain't got to wait till you're 21 to be an adult. Matter of fact, you can be 21 and still be a kid. But he's a 16-year-old. He's a Amen. And the scripture says he speaks well and is fine looking man. And the Lord's with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son, David, who's with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them with his son, David, to Saul. David came to Saul, entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers, somebody that took care of his, stood in front of him during war, holding up a shield. He also played music to calm the spirits in his life. It's an amazing time. It was obvious God was drawing David in to groom him. You know, we, when we all saw his heart, we saw it clearly. The Philistines began to invade the land. The Philistines had some the Israelites didn't. They could melt steel, make swords. They had a huge army, and they began to move down on them. Amen. And when they moved down on them, 1 Samuel 17 tells us that David went there to bring bread. He brought stuff and cheese to his brothers. The three oldest brothers were there. And when he gets there, when David got there, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? He just asked a question. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, again, 40 days, 40 days, Goliath began to taunt Israel. A month and 10 days. And I've often said, fee, fi, fo, fum. Amen. Uh, he, he just begins to scream at them, who is this Israelite scum? He begins to yell at them and mock them. And, they, and David gets there and he hears it. Now they're scared. They repeated to him what had been said of the king. This is what will be done for those who kills him. Now, listen, 
We'll get to that in just a minute, what, what's going to be done. But you don't know me. You remember last week I preached a message called, you don't know me? They didn't know Jesus. They didn't understand who. You don't know me, my brother. He was raised up with these guys. And I'd have to go into Scripture to help you understand this. But David is not a biological uh, full brother of all these other brothers. He's a half-brother. His mom and their mom ain't the same mama. So here's David. He's out there tending sheep with another seven boys in the house. It was as if Jesse just, he just somebody out there taking care of sheep. But then he comes in, and Eliab says to him, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And look at him, put him down. And with whom did you leave those few sheep? What you're doing is insignificant in the wilderness. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You come down only to watch the battle. Hold on. You know how wicked my heart is? I was chosen because God saw my heart. And you say my heart is wicked? You don't know me. Amen. You've not been through battles with me. You ain't understood who I am yet. Amen. So he begins to speak. I think Eliab was embarrassed that after 40 days, nobody made a move on, on, on Goliath. Nobody tried to go after him. And, and David says, now what have I done? Amen. I can't even speak. The scripture says he turned his back on them. Sometimes the best thing you can do is walk away from people. Amen. You know what? You said something stupid. I ain't even going to talk to you. Then he turned around and asked the question, uh, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason some of us fight here? And then the incentive was brought out. Now, hear me. There is a great reason we don't want to fight. First off, Goliath is nine foot tall. The other thing I understood is that he wore a shirt of bronze that weighed 125 pounds. I promise you, David probably didn't weigh 125 pounds. He probably did a little skinny thing. He had a bronze helmet to protect him. Amen. He had these, these bronze leaves over his feet and, and his shins to look after him. He had an iron tip on the end of his spear that weighed 15 pounds. Put 15 pounds on the end of a, of a 10-foot stick and hold it up. Then he got a little armor bear running around in front of him. And he's coming down every day defying the, the armies of God. You know, it's amazing. So David had, to, again, he asked the question, what, what the guy going to get that takes care of him? Chapter 17, verse 25 says, Now the Israelites have been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He keeps coming out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and exempt his family from taxes in Israel. These three powerful things was because Saul was so scared. He was trying to find somebody and give enough incentive for somebody to come out and take care of him. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you a woman. And I'm going to make sure you have withholding taxes. And I'm sure some of them thought, you know what? I don't mind paying taxes because taxes help support Israel. I, I don't, you know, I've already got a good woman at home. I don't need another woman. One, one, one more would be trouble. Uh, you know, they come up with all kinds of excuses not to fight. But David said, you know, there has to be a reason we go out and fight this thing, amen, and deal with it. So the resume, when David, when, when David was asked by King Saul, what makes you think you could take him out? David said, God has helped me save my sheep from a bear and a lion, and he can help me rescue the people of Israel and Goliath. Why am I having church here this morning? Because I've already been through storms over here. I've already been through lions and bears. Hello. Amen. We've already dealt with life. Uh, how, why did I say it to Ranchester uh, this week? Because I've already been through it. Amen. Now, if it got bad enough, yeah, I'd have pulled on out of there. I'd done it before. But, but the bottom line is somebody got to stay there and, and protect the property that, that we've all purchased. Can I get an amen? So when he walked out of the king's tent with a determined step, you know, people have never seen that before. He came out. He, he wasn't wearing the king's armor. Even the king should. He tried to put, on, tried to put armor on him. It wasn't going to fit him. So he, David runs out and he grabs a, a four, five stones out of a brook. He puts them in his pouch, puts one in his sling, and he starts moving. Now his brothers are watching him, and they, they, they know that young man is fast. They, they probably tried to whoop him before, and they couldn't catch him. And David starts running out toward Goliath, and Goliath sees him coming. Goliath, when he saw him coming, Goliath got mad because David's got a stick in one hand, his staff, and a sling in the other. And he said, what are you doing? He said, y'all sending a kid toward me? I'll take him and I'll feed his flesh to the birds and the fowl of the air. And David said, aha, uh I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord. And by the way, I'm taking your head from your shoulders. I love when there's a smart aleck anointing on people. 
You know, he's just being a smart aleck. I could have said something else, but I don't need to. You know what I mean? And he runs right toward him, and there's this defying moment. And, and, and you know what happened. David looked at Goliath, and, amen, and he, he swung his sling and pushed off that foot, and he released that stone at the same time, same time. And the sound of thousands and thousands of men holding their breath. It was like slow motion as that stone went through the air. And the only vulnerable place on Goliath was here. And people said it had to be the, the finger of God. No, that was experience. He had taken out a lion and a bear. He was extremely good with his abilities and talents that he had. Amen. I, I, I went through Scripture. I can't find one biblical miracle that King David ever had. Moses had them. Abraham had them. Amen. We see it in the news. But sometimes you'll go through life and never have a miracle, so you better get skillful. So the stone hits Goliath upside the head. Amen. His knees buckled. His eyes went wide, and he went face down. Without a moment's hesitation, David moved clo closer, and he did what he said he'd do. He removed his head from his shoulders, and Eliab stood there, the oldest brother, and then he understood, why him, not me? Why him, not me? First, because God said so. Sometimes I can't answer the question other than God said so. Second, because God looks at the heart and not the exterior. Sometimes it's not all the flash that you've seen. It's the heart. The third reason is because David could handle power, and evidently Eliab couldn't. That when you become the king of Israel, you become the most powerful man in the world. And even though David may have stumbled some, can you imagine how bad it would have been had that eldest brother became the king? Amen. So God saw this is right. And here's the, here's the best point. Because Goliath was David's giant to kill. Some of you have giants I can't kill for you. You've got to kill them. They're your giant to kill. I got my own devils to deal with. You got your devils to deal with. Amen. You got your giants to kill. So that's what we see took place there. And here's my other thing. Let me go back to last week's man. You don't know me. Did you know after the death of Goliath, David's got his hair in his hands and the bloody stump of his neck, and he's carrying that head. The Philistines are run off. The Israelites are plunder, plundering them. And it's 1 Samuel 17, verse 57 says, David returned from killing the Philistine. Abner took him and brought him before Saul. And David still holding the Philistine's head. How many know if you got a trophy, hold on to it? <laughs> hey, man, I walked into a man's house yesterday where Josiah stayed, and he got all them trophies on the wall, all them deer heads on the wall. Every one of them got a story. In my mind's eye, I don't know. I know this sounds morbid to some of you, but I think when David went in his tent, he hung that head on the wall right next to a lion head and a bear head. Hey, man, you know, they're my trophies right there. Hey, man, they're still, and, he, and this is what the question, the question that, that King Saul asked was this, whose son are you, young man? David said, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. Do you remember me telling you already that David had been his armor bearer, had been the psalmist to calm the spirits in his heart, and even then, Saul didn't know him. Some of you will be in this church with each other for years, and you don't know one another because you have not decided to get to know one another. I don't want to be mean about this, but some of you need to suck it up and make some new friends. Connect with people and ask them their story. Do you know the Burgess's story? I know a little bit. I did their wedding many years ago. I watched them walk through stuff. Did you know Mag's story? She used to play uh, softball for Oklahoma State Cowboys. Whose story do you know? Do you know this story? And the more stories you know, Amen. The more you know one another and how they went through life and how they dealt. Do you know little Debbie over here? I watched her and her husband cleaning out the, the, the food pantry yesterday as it got flooded with four foot of water. About four foot? You give out four foot of water in that place, hauling all that stuff. And she's going to restock it to make sure we're able to feed people when they're hungry. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 You don't know me. You don't know me. Acts chapter 12. Come on, Rain. Is that the best you got? 
<laughs> now I want you to ponder, and this will be short, so. Then I mean nothing mean by this, but when I had Josiah in my truck with me, and I had my Josiah, my son in my truck with me, and people called uh, redundantly on my phone, I talked with them, and he would say something. They said, who's that? I said, that's Brown Joe. White Joe's in here. I got White Joe and Brown Joe. <laughs> Amen. So, got to differentiate. They all everybody names start with J out there. <laughs> Every one of us. I don't know if we can hire anybody whose name don't start with J anymore. James, John, Peter. They're the inner circle. There are 12 disciples, but there's Pete and J.J. Pete, James, and John was with Jesus when Jairus' daughter was healed. Pete, James, and John was with Jesus on Mount Transfiguration. Pete, James, and John was with Jesus and Gethsemane when other disciples couldn't go. They are the inner circle. These three are close. James and John are the sons of Berigines. Amen. They're the sons of thunder. They're the ones that want to call down uh, lightning. Amen. And fire on the Samaritans. And burn them up. And James and John got a mama that had the boldness to go before Jesus and say, Jesus, would you let my boy sit on your right side and left side when you get to heaven? And Jesus said, it ain't my, it ain't my, my call to say who's going to sit by me when we get to heaven. That's my father's decision. It ain't my decision. These boys were bold, man. Amen. There's something about them. Now we get into Acts chapter 12, and the only disciple that was martyred that's recorded in the Word of God is James. He is Jesus. I mean, I'm sorry. He's John's brother who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Follow me? So now we find him. Here, and I called it heaven, hell, and in between. Heaven, it was about this time the king Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, beheaded, the in between. Then he saw that this met the approval among the Jews. He proceeded to seize Peter. Also, this happened during the festival of un unleavened bread, which tells me that James died about 44 A.D., somewhere in the month of July. Amen. That was the time of the unleavened bread. He proceeded to seize Peter, and this happened during the festival. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover, have him beheaded. So I want you to hear this. I'm reading this passage this week, and it hit me. Why him, not me? Why, why did James, one of the three, get beheaded and not me? You are never going to be able to answer this question in this lifetime. You're not going to be able to do it. Some of you have struggled with family, the loss of a spouse, a child, Finances, divorce, why them and not me? And I thought, this is me. I mean, I'm, I, we're, going, we're hitting this storm around Wednesday and Thursday, and all in my mind I'm thinking, why them, not me? Why my friends, not, why Pastor Pat Dubois, who I loved, did I have to do his funeral and not me? Why have you left me? Why'd you take them? Peter, he's the boisterous one. But so is James. Why him, not me? He's dead. I'm in jail. Now there's four. How powerful was Peter's ability to preach? Four soldiers in rotation. And if you keep reading the chapter, Tommy, you're going to read where two of the soldiers were sleeping. Peter was between them, and they're sleeping beside him. And two soldiers are at the door, and an angel shows up and wakes Peter up. And I, it blows my mind. When James has been beheaded, and you're sleeping? Why are you sleeping? Because no matter what happens, the worst thing you can do to me is send me to heaven. 
So I'm going to sleep right now. And the angel wakes him up, Kenny, and says, get up. And got him up out of, out of the bed. Peter thought he was dreaming. Have you ever had one of them dreams that you thought you were dreaming? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You ever had a dream and you thought you were in reality? And you were going to the restroom? Y'all laugh because you know I'm telling the truth, don't you? Amen. So, so, so here he wakes up, and the angel says, come on. And they go to the prison door, and look, the doors open. It was, it was like them Walmart doors. Just opened automatically. Amazing. And the angel had to tell Peter to go back and put his clothes on. He was wearing his PJs. He had to go back and get his regular clothes on. He goes to a house that was praying for him. Let me ask you a question. You don't think somebody was praying for James? You don't think his brother John was praying for him and Peter was praying for him and Thomas was praying for him and Matthew, Matthew was praying for him? They all prayed for James. And he still lost his head and died. This man who ran with Jesus. Jesus told them they were going to be persecuted. Somebody told me yesterday, I was talking to him on the phone from up in Arkansas, and they said, you, watch out, Christians are going to start getting persecuted in America. I said, it's about time. It's about time. Because we've sure had it made. Quit complaining. God's been good to us. Amen. Prepare yourself for whatever's coming. It ain't about running and hiding. It's about being bolder. So, and believing God for crazy stuff. Peter, Peter gets up. He goes over to the house knocks on the door. Now, again, I don't know how he knows there's a prayer meeting going on in that house. He must have known the people. So he knocks on the door. A girl named Rhoda, the Bible gives us a name. Rhoda comes to the door, peeks through the peak hole, and sees Peter standing outside the door. Now, they praying inside the house. Lord, release Peter. Get him out of jail. James is dead. We need somebody to lead us. Please, God, we can't do this on our own. Give us the wave walker. <gasps> Peter's at the door. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. And they argue with Rhoda. That Peter was at the door. Some of you been praying for things. God's answering them, and you still can't believe it. Oh. Ain't no way he's doing that. Amen. It's going to flood again. Come on. And it didn't. You mean I put all this stuff up for nothing? Yes. Yes, yes, amen. Don't be surprised if your answer's at the door. Don't be shocked because God answered your prayer. And don't be sad when somebody that loved Jesus went on to be with him. This is just transition. This is just a place that we, this world has fallen. The only thing holding this together is you. You're the salt of the earth. You're keeping it from rotting, amen, and being destroyed. When God takes us out of here, this place is really going to disintegrate. But until then, Jesus came and walked this place and showed us how to live. Use him as your example. Keep your peace. Fight for it. Believe God for the best. Accept the verdict. And understand you may never understand why him and not me in this lifetime. Amen. But God knows what's best and he sees the heart. Father, I thank you for the resilient people, people that have been through troubles and trials and tribulations. God, they've, they, they've seen it and yet they smile and laugh because they know that the best is still yet to come. You've got our hand. We're in your hands. We're at the door. Amen. Some of us have been rescued. Some have been brought through the fire. Some have been rescued from it. We thank you, God, again for your mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a praise. And
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Our servant leaders are going to make their way to you. Appreciate your prayers as travel toward Alabama and parts unknown. If you got a tither off or an envelope, it's in front of you. I, I imagine after Muscle Car Sunday and this, this week, things can be a little down financially for some, but I thank you for giving. I don't know all the people that we may end up helping through all this. We have people in our church who got water in their homes. Some three foot, four foot, five foot. You know, anybody that lives near a river bottom, you know, it, it's apt to happen. I always get to, uh, well, never mind, quit, Jerry. Uh, let me just give you some announcements very quickly. This week is first week midweek. Pastor Joseph will be teaching Tuesday night here in the uh, Fellowship Hall, and then Wednesday night out in New Caney. Amen. So please come and support him and, and Josiah and the ministry here of the church. Hallelujah. Prepare for next week. Invite your mama to church. Mama, this is your opportunity to use influence. Mama, that's when you say, son, daughter, the only thing I want for Mother's Day is for you to come to church with me. Grandma, amen. This is your moment. Work it. Work it. Amen. Get them to the house next week. Amen. As we give today, we're believing God for benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and return, debts to models, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. Woo. How many have ever asked that question? Why them, not us? Man, how Peter had to think that. Did you know at the end of chapter 12? Listen to this. You need to read it. I don't know. If you read your Bible every now and then, it really bless you. Uh, the end of chapter 12, Herod, God strikes him. Peggy, you ready for this? Strikes him with worms. He got worms. When I think of worms, I always think of uh, what happens to to pets, you know, at times. You don't hear humans getting struck with worms a whole lot. But the worms ate him up, and he died. So guys, God said, you know, that's why I said heaven, hell, and in between. James went to heaven, Peter stayed between, and Herod went to hell. Heaven, hell, and in between. Amen. Don't worry about your enemies. God will take care of them. Amen. Maybe sometimes you say, you know, mate, you better watch yourself. God could give you worms. You'd be scooching your honey across the carpet. You ain't going to get this in any other church, I promise you. Oh, quit, Jerry. Come on, stand up here with me.